Honorable Dr. Anasua Basu Rain Chowdhury, Senior Fellow Observer, uh, Senior Fellow Observer Research Foundation, ORF, Kolkata, India. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. We at Maidas are indeed honoured to have with us today, Dr. Anasua Basu Rain Chowdhury from Calcutta, India. She's currently a Senior Fellow and a Program Coordinator at uh, Observer Research Foundation, ORF. <coughs> Kolkata under its uh, Neighbourhood Regional Studies Initiative. Her areas of interest include regionalism in South Asia, borders, migration and displacement, energy security and women in South Asia. In conjunction with her visit to Maidas, we are fortunate to be able to listen to her presentation titled India's uh, Maritime Connectivity, Importance of the Bay of Bengal. Bay of Bengal. So before we continue today's uh, presentation by her, I would like to invite the Chief Executive of Maidas, Vice Admiral Dato Ganesh Navaratnam, to give his opening remarks. Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are fortunate today to have Dr. Anuswa. Um, I met her uh, when I went, I was invited by ORF. Uh, you might ask me ORF, so I had to Google and find out what is ORF also. It's a quite a big organization, uh, Observers Research Foundation in India. They have uh, chapters in Kolkata, they have chapters in, I think, New Delhi, uh, in uh, Mumbai. It's a quite a big organization, a big think tank. Um, and their field of studies is quite numerous. Being an Indian trained officer uh, in Gunnery for eight months in Cochin, um, it is good that uh, I had a chance to now visit the other side of the eastern part of uh, India. Uh, similarly, uh, the eastern part of India um, is just like uh, the eastern part of uh, Peninsula, uh, whereas the western side is quite developed, the eastern part is not as developed as the western. So, similar to Peninsula, uh, the western part of Peninsula is very well developed and the eastern part is slowly developing. So you, you can do this comparative. Um, uh, only thing that uh, I put the, the doctor in a uh, fix is because we sent an email out a couple of days earlier before she arrived so that she could prepare her presentation. So I don't think so she has any slides, but I prepared a slide for her, one slide, uh, basically is to tell us where Kolkata is, if nobody knows where it is, uh, in, the, in the sphere of the Bay of Bengal. So um, she will be, I think, talking off uh, her car. And I invite uh, you to ask questions. Uh, I don't think so she's going to limit herself to Bay of Bengal. So you can ask a couple of questions because when I was in uh, the International Conference on Significance of Bay of Bengal, uh, India, Japan and South Asia. I was given a, uh, a, a, a tough topic to talk about strategic convergence and divergence. Okay, uh, I, and that also again I have to Google and find out what is the strategic uh, convergence and divergence uh, being from the operational world, just came out from uh, Sulu Sea. So, um, it's interesting to know how Bay of Bengal uh, is coming into the picture of this whole uh, geopolitic and geo uh, strategic of, of what we are going to do. Uh, we always have an Indian Ocean. We had we have heard about Straits of Malacca. We heard about South China Sea, Sulu Sea, the Pacific Ocean. We heard about this new terminology, Asia Pacific, changing to Indo Pacific. Uh, so all these are happening, but Bay of Bengal is not always on our radar. So it's been interesting to know what is actually Bay of Bengal about. Why is uh, ORF uh, visiting Malaysia suddenly? Uh, and the study that they have been doing, I think she will explain to you, uh, is not just uh, a, a six months project, it seems to be a long project. So without further ado, uh, I would like to invite a doctor to present uh, uh, her view on Bay of Bengal and its significance and its importance to Malaysia. Uh, I think that it would be the most important thing. But uh, not uh, not just Malaysia, but 
how Bay of Bengal is going to play uh, in the future, especially for those guys from the Navy. Uh, maritime domain is going to be something which is now the, the center of focus. And uh, Defense White Paper is also talking about Malaysia as a maritime nation. So uh, probably we have to give a few thoughts about this. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you so much, Vice Admiral Navratnam. Uh, thank you so much for giving me that space to share <coughs> some of my uh, sketchy thoughts, uh, which is, of course, no, not baseless because we are and we have been working on this issue for last uh, two years. And uh, at the very outset, let me uh, confess that uh, you know, because of uh, miscommunication, somehow we didn't get uh, uh, information of this kind of proper presentation that I'm supposed to uh, give at your uh, you know, esteemed center. So uh, my thoughts will be uh, basically in a sharing mode and uh, in some extent uh, it will be a kind of uh, informal uh, sharing rather than official sharing from uh, my organization of Zabal Research Foundation. At the very outset I think it is important to tell a few words on ORF. Observer Research Foundation is number one private uh, public policy think tank at this moment in India. And uh, we do research in different, uh, different topics. Uh, we have, uh, of course, cutting across different issues uh, in terms of foreign policy, in terms of domestic policies. We have uh, four branches in all over India. Main headquarter is in Delhi and Mumbai, Chennai, and Kolkata. And from all our, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> our um, centers, we are uh, the new entrant, which means Kolkata came into existence in uh, 2013. And since then, we have marked our existence uh, so far as scholarly, you know, interactions, scholarly publications are concerned. And uh, our research on uh, the Bay of Bengal is one of them. Uh, we have shared our, uh, you know, our uh, project report with the uh, Vice Admiral when he was in Calcutta. It is the uh, offshoot of uh, first year's uh, report, and we are in the second phase. Uh, we are working on uh, significance of Bay of Bengal keeping the fact in mind the government of India uh, has put uh, emphasis on importance, increasing importance of uh, maritime issues connecting Bay of Bengal and of course it's not limited within Bay of Bengal looking uh, towards uh, Indo-Pacific as uh, Vice Admiral uh, of course has uh, touched upon. So our uh, project uh, mainly uh, India's maritime connectivity uh, with the Bay Littoral states. But whenever we are looking at connectivity, it's not confined within, uh, within the connectivity in terms of logistics. But uh, what we felt that connectivity has different connotations in different areas. So we have incorporated three main segments one is, of course, logistics, which is the bedrock of any kind of uh, connection. So uh, within this particular logistics domain, we are looking at uh, what are the major uh, prospects and problems in terms of uh, port connectivity. Uh, so uh, from this uh, perspective, we visited all the major ports of our country in East Coast because uh, unless we know our country better, it will not be possible to go beyond our country. So we started our visits from all the major ports, say for example, uh, of course Kolkata and Holdia, these are located in our main domain as we belong to Kolkata. But we visited Vizag. Uh, you know uh, that Vizag is coming up very fast so far as the development of port 
ports are concerned in India. And also we visited Chennai, we visited uh, uh, Ennore, and also we wanted to see, because all these ports are government-sponsored port, uh, ports, and uh, we know that how public uh, partnership has come up uh, very efficiently in terms of West Coast, specifically in terms of Mundra. So we wanted to see how it works in uh, in, the, uh, in our East Coast. So we visited uh, Katipalu, which is uh, the leading private port. Um, it was earlier, uh, you know, run by uh, Larson and Tubro. Uh, um, yes, uh, and and then. Uh, it has been, uh, it has been uh, taken uh, by, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, what's the, uh, Adani group, yes, the Adani group, who is also in charge of uh, the port Mundra. And uh, after visiting these uh, main ports in our east coast, we wanted to see how the ports are uh, being operated in our neighborhood, say, uh, for example, in Bangladesh because we know that we share the common EEZ, you know, and sometimes we have a conflicting uh, attitude so far as using uh, the economic benefits of uh, EEZ. So mm, we wanted to see how the ports uh, are being operated uh, by them. So we visited the main Chittagong ports, port, and uh, also we uh, we we visited uh, a Dhaka port, and uh, we wanted to uh, see the other terminals as well. What are the main problems they are facing, and how coastal shipping agreement? Because you know that in 2016, India and Bangladesh they have signed coastal shipping agreement between them. How this coast, coastal shipping agreement can be? Uh, you know, can be enriched, enhanced, and can be of major help to strengthen uh, bilateral maritime connectivity between each other. I'm not very sure how many of you are actually aware of the fact that uh, Bangladesh and India, they have signed long time back in 1972 uh, the, the the protocol uh, routes agreement, which means that uh, you know that we have many common across border uh, river. Uh, the, their numbers are like 54. So uh, both the governments decided a uh, long time back that uh, how uh, these river, rivers can be utilized uh, by both the, uh, the countries. And uh, they decided to designate some uh, routes for uh, the betterment of uh, trade and uh, cargo. So they named it as Indo-Bangla Protocol Route for uh, trading, trading arrangements. Uh, since 1972, it was not in a, uh, a very good shape, but very recently it gained its momentum. And both the government, they decided to designate two, three main routes to develop the this uh, in, in you know inter country waterways connectivity and uh, they have decided to designate some specific uh, commodity uh, to trade in between through these uh, waterways and uh, the question may be arised how india can be benefited uh, you know the geographical so far as geographical location of india is concerned uh, strange part is uh, or the very important thing is uh, the location of India's northeast. You know this northeast is surrounded from all these uh, its uh, uh, you know uh, borders with Bangladesh. So it is very important to have uh, free flow connectivity with Bangladesh for India in order to develop India's northeastern states and not Northeastern region has uh, say eight specific states. So, uh, if we can, uh, you know, strengthen our connectivity with Bangladesh through these waterways, it will, in a way, help us to develop our northeastern states. So that's why we have de designated 
national waterway actually i'm not carrying that slides but it's a beautiful slides you can see you know all the uh, maps of uh, these waterways uh, but just let me share you <coughs> that uh, we have at this moment uh, operative two main waterways uh, that is national waterway one and national waterway two uh, this National Waterway 2 is uh, specifically designated for, uh, I'm sorry, National Waterway 2 and National Waterway uh, 6. National Waterway 2 is a part of our protocol route and uh, it connects the major states like Assam, Meghalaya, uh, touching uh, Tripura uh, for, uh, you know, waterways connectivity and also we are uh, now thinking of how other tributaries of Brahmaputra can be utilized for uh, water-bound uh, trade uh, to strengthen our connectivity with uh, Bangladesh. And um, then we decided uh, to go to Sri Lanka because uh, we know that uh, it is also very important to understand Sri Lanka's perspective regarding the uh, the benefits of Bay of Bengal and how it can be, the maritime connectivity can be strengthened. So we viewed, uh, we, uh, we visited Colombo port and apart from Colombo port, we decided to go to Trincomalee because though we know that it has not touched in that way uh, so far as commercial benefits are concerned, but it is uh, extremely, uh, you know, um, uh, extremely uh, uh, beneficial if we can utilize uh, the, the entire uh, capacity of, uh, of Trinko Valley port. Then we decided to, uh, in, in the first phase, we decided to uh, cover India's Andaman and Nicobar Island, keeping the fact in mind Andaman and Nicobar Island is uh, is very important uh, so far as uh, India's strategy is concerned uh, from two three perspectives. First one is from strategic perspective. Of course, you are experts of these domains. So, as a researcher, I'm not going to uh, you know uh, stretch of this field. But again, I think. From another important perspective, Andaman has actually marked its existence. That is, how to deal with hum humanitarian assistance and disaster management, which is called in a nutshell HADR. And that's why we have decided to incorporate a separate major section of research on how to deal with, uh, you know, uh, deal with the humanitarian assistance and disaster management so far as the literal states are concerned. And after visiting there, we uh, got information that after uh, 2004 tsunami, you know, they have started a kind of really remarkable war because all of us, we know that how United Nations has prescribed the inclusion or imposition of Sunday framework in uh, in uh, managing disaster management, which is in a nutshell is basically decentralization of the entire framework of managing uh, uh, disasters. So in that case, uh, Andaman has actually played a pivotal role uh, <coughs> by engaging local community into the entire framework which means local community are being incorporated and the fully awareness program being launched. And these, uh, the representatives of local communities, they are also party to it, which means they are not only a kind of, uh, you know, a, in a receiving mode of the entire discourse, but they have become active partners, which is a very, very important part. And after getting this information, we came back to Calcutta and we wanted to see in how many cases actually we saw this kind of engagement of local community in that entire gamut of uh, managing uh, these uh, you know, disasters. And we think that in that particular field, Andaman can play a pivotal role. And uh, we know that 
Bay of Bengal has a kind of structural framework, structural institutional framework like Bay of Beng Bengal, you know, uh, initiative for multi-sectoral commun technical communication, which likes BIMSTEC. So within BIMSTEC, we know that uh, these humanitarian assistance and disaster management, it also plays very important role. And where we think that Andaman can be put forth as a model how it can develop a kind of decentralization uh, in their policy formulation. And uh, uh, it was precisely, and also we included Myanmar in our uh, report. And uh, personally, um, you know, my colleague Pratnashi is here. Both of us, we visited all these, uh, uh, these countries along with Myanmar. And uh, in Myanmar, we specifically wanted to visit uh, <coughs> the Sitwe province because you know Indian government has very heavy investment in the development of uh, Sitwe, specifically in terms of Kaladan uh, multimodal project. And uh, in this uh, project, which is important, is to uh, develop uh, Kaladan port. So we precisely decided to visit the port, and we visited. Uh, we got generous help and uh, enthusiasm from Myanmar government. And it's because of their help we reached there. We talked to uh, local people as well as uh, the people uh, from the Indian government, those who were uh, those who were engaged, being engaged uh, in the development of port. Uh, basically, the organization called ACER, which is uh, working, uh, we talked to them just to understand their perspective. But uh, what we got, the information that uh, the development of port has been done, 95%, uh, more than 95%. But the multimodal needs of that particular project he has yet to uh, achieve uh, because certain stretches between India's northeastern border, precisely the border uh, from Myan uh, Mizoram with Myanmar, uh, till Sitwe province, uh, some stretches are not uh, in uh, very good shape. Uh, the entire stretch it has 70 bridges and out of these 70 bridges only one bridge has been uh, you know renovated by uh, Myanmar's authority except that 69 bridges are not yet uh, you know uh, renovated if these are in dilapidated uh, conditions so miles to go before we uh, will achieve our uh, you know uh, fl flawless connectivity across border. So that's why they say that multimodal nays of that particular project is missing. But so far as the port of Kaladan, it's uh, all of us we know that it's a riverine port. So a port of Kaladan is ready and uh, the technocrats are uh, very much willing to have a direct access from Calcutta because if we go back to the ancient time we will uh, see that Calcutta actually played a very very important role so far as maritime trade connectivity was concerned with this, all the Southeast Asian uh, countries. So um, and of course apart from Chennai, Chennai port. So. Uh, they also <coughs> said that it will take only uh, four, not more than four days to reach Calcutta from Sitwe province if they connect direct line from uh, Kaladan port to Calcutta port. And after coming back to Calcutta, what we did is we had a series of meeting with Calcutta port authority. And the chairperson is very uh, cordial. And uh, he is also uh, helping our project uh, in a big way. And uh, he also inspired us uh, while to take up all the other neighborhood countries apart from the countries that you are concerning at this moment. And also we have decided to expand our study to the other Southeast Asian countries by including Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, up to Singapore to make it a sense in a holistic way how Bay of Bengal literal countries are at this moment, uh, you know, situated. Uh, with all these 
concerns. Uh, we know that we have some common concerns, but we have different views to look at it. So we, what we wanted to know is the different perception from these concerned countries, because we know that perception varies from one place to another. And as a researcher, it is also very important to know that maybe some, in some cases it may be uh, critical, but that critical perception. And that's why we are here uh, in Malaysia uh, in our second phase of our study. Uh, we started our second phase with, uh, with the country like Thailand. And uh, in Thailand, we visited uh, many ports along with, uh, of course, its lead port, <coughs> Lanchabang. But what we have found interesting is the prospect of uh, the port like Ranong. Uh, so far as the development uh, of Bay of Bengal or the Bimstek is concerned, because Thai government at this pro uh, moment showing extreme interest to develop uh, the port Ranong to get a direct access with the uh, with uh, Chittagong and which means that if they can develop a coastal shipping at, uh, at least we will come up with that kind of uh, proposal as well in our report if they can develop a direct uh, linkage or direct coastal shipping uh, agreement or arrangement between between uh, Ranong and Chittagong, then in another way it will help uh, India uh, to get um, access via uh, via Chittagong uh, to Ranong. And uh, also because it is not uh, possible to have a coastal shipping arrangement between between uh, Thai ports and uh, India uh, Indian ports in East Coast just because of uh, because of uh, you know uh, dense density of water, uh, in as we all know that in terms of uh, coastal shipping agreement, uh, all the ships that are being used these are medium vessels or the rural vessels, uh, but uh, in in the proper maritime domain it's the big vessels. So the big vessels will not be uh, used between uh, Thailand and India because of the density of water is not much uh, in the Bay of Bengal. So we have got this information. Again, we shared information with the uh, with, um, uh, Port Authority of Calcutta because they are also very keen to have a direct access from Ranong to Calcutta. So what is very interesting uh, from Myanmar and also from Thailand is that they wanted to have a direct access from their end to Kolkata, which means in a way it's a kind of initiative to re revive the the past, uh, you know, glory of uh, the East Coast that we enjoyed once upon a time to have a kind of maritime connectivity with these uh, Southeast Asian countries. Uh, so we are here also to understand uh, if you do also feel in that way that you have that kind of uh, you know prospects to have direct linkages with the east coast uh, of uh, India and Malaysia. We know that uh, your major port is Port Klang. We are hopeful that we will be visiting the port uh, tomorrow. And we will place a series of questions that we have prepared for them. But while working on this port connectivity and logistics, again and again, the main question which has come up in our mind is, port connectivity is not the main thing. This is the bedrock of connectivity, yes. But it depends on how much trade are being done in between. If we have good connectivity and no demand for trade, what will be what uh, will be the use of this kind of trade? You know that has been that question has been raised again and again in Thailand, and we are very fortunate that Thai uh, Port Authority of Thailand they sent a big delegation just last month to have a con constructive meeting with us. How this demand for trade can be generated? what are the major products that we can think of being traded in between so that uh, we will have a kind of balance between 
uh, utilization of port as well as uh, you know increase in our uh, trade connectivity figures uh, this is in a nutshell uh, about our project so our project has been divided into three main segments one is port logistics but I have already uh, probably justified how these segments have been uh, related in between. The second major aspect uh, is, um, is HADR, that is Humanitarian Assistance and uh, Disaster Management. <coughs> Keeping the fact in mind that all these uh, Bay concerned littoral states are prone to disasters. So uh, we want to see how common rule-based order can be developed uh, by including Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore in it. So our proposal, proposal probably uh, would be um, in order to cater Bay of Bengal, uh, it is not uh, advisable to confine only with BIMSTEC but we may include uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore to deal with Bay of Bengal in more constructive and holistic manner. I'm not telling that BIMSTEC is not working or BIMSTEC is not uh, what mentioning. This will be the stepping stone, definitely, but we have to think ahead by including, uh, you know, through a kind of inclusiveness in order to uh, in order to um, deal with uh, all the major concerns. Well, uh, and the third one, which uh, Vice Admiral has uh, mentioned as a most uh, critical one, is strategic uh, convergences and divergences. Because as I uh, pointed out uh, at the very outset, that we have some common concerns, but different uh, v visions or different views to look at it. Uh, say, for example, you are uh, closely associated with the Strait of Malacca. And uh, we are also associated with Straits of Malacca because you know that uh, more than 80% of Indian <laughs> Strait is uh, coming via, uh, you know, Indian Ocean. So uh, these Straits are really uh, important uh, for India as well. And uh, what uh, we would, we we will uh, definitely intend to know what's your perception how India can be included in the framework of, uh, of uh, you know, maintaining that order in Straits of Malacca, because we have got information that, um, you know, uh, at this moment, four uh, countries, you are uh, really uh, concerned about the, the order and the mechanisms, uh, corporate mechanisms of uh, Straits of Malacca, but how India can be included in it we want to know your perception because we visited Singapore as well before coming here. We have got a uh, different perception. Uh, my colleague uh, Pratoshi was in Indonesia. So we are collecting this kind of perception from different uh, countries, how to deal with that. And uh, we know that, uh, uh, it, I mean to say, it's not a kind of denying fact that uh, increasing importance of uh, China in the Bay of Bengal uh, in recent times also is uh, gaining its, uh, you know, um, salience and importance in, in different aspects. So uh, with these, uh, you know, uh, factors in mind, our uh, report and our uh, study it includes these strategic convergences and divergences. This is, in a nutshell, a brief overview of our report. But again, I think it is also important to place the entire Bay of Bengal region in a slightly broader perspective, which is in the Pacific. And a shift, and a sh shift of mode from Asia-Pacific to Indo-Pacific. I think um, all of us, we are here, uh, you know, using that term in the Pacific, in the Pacific, but it is important to know how these particular construct, because it's a kind of construct, so how this construct <coughs> has gained its momentum 
in Indian uh, diplomacy, in Indian maritime domain. Uh, this is not new. Long time back in 2004, also it has been highlighted in Indian maritime doctrine that how our main emphasis from uh, Atlantic Pacific, you know, this linkage, it may shift to Pacific and uh, Indian Ocean linkage. But very recently, uh, you know, in uh, 2018, our Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, has also talked about uh, the clear picture of what India actually thinks of or specifies as Indo-Pacific. It's not our strategy, like, um, you know, as uh, Donald Trump has, uh, has uh, mentioned it, but it is uh, it is something which includes inclusiveness, which includes openness. So let me uh, just clearly uh, say two, three uh, lines on, uh, on what India thinks about, about our uh, Indo-Pacific. As I have already uh, told you that it's a kind of sketchy, you know, sharing mode. So just allow me to read something that we have uh, we have uh, prepared uh, for our latest uh, publication. <clears throat> well, the terminology Indo-Pacific as a new construct is gaining more currency in recent times with several countries referring to these terms in their official statements. The American President Donald Trump repeatedly used the expression during his 12-day Asia tour last year to showcase the rise of India and the U.S. growing ties with the country. Moreover, the budding realization in the strategic circles about the linkages between the Indian and the Pacific Ocean has also gained ground. As far as India is concerned, this association between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific is nothing new. In 2004, the Indian Maritime Doctrine alluded to the shift in global maritime focus from the Atlantic Pacific combination to the Pacific Indian. Therefore, in rest, uh, in, uh, therefore, in recent times, beyond the Indian Ocean, the Western Pacific has now been identified as falling within the ambit of India's security interests. The focus on maritime issues is evident from the increase in maritime exchanges led by the Indian Navy with countries such as Vietnam, Singapore, Indonesia, and Japan. India's trade in this region is growing rapidly with most of her overseas investments are now directed to the east. India has comprehensive economic partnership agreements with Japan, with South Korea, and Singapore, free trade agreements with ASEAN and Thailand, and it also entering into negotiations for the early conclusions of the RCEP, which is the Regional Comprehensive, Econo Comprehensive Economic Partnership. India's approach to the region is exemplified by its uh, evolving act is policy, comprising economic engagement with Southeast Asian countries and strategic cooperation beyond Southeast Asia to East Asia, which means Japan, Republic of Korea, Australia, New Zealand, as well as the Pacific Islands countries. Nevertheless, the term lacks holistic acceptance in the, in the region. While China is aggressive about the uh, connotation, there is a lurking fear among, among the ASEAN 
among the ASEAN nations as well to some extent that they could be marginalized if the new uh, concept uh, comes into being. Despite being in use in the Indian policy circles for a longer period of time, the term Indo-Pacific for the first time gained uh, a clear meaning and vision from the current uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi's key uh, statement at the Shangri-La Dialogue took place in January to 2018, where he mentioned that India has been an active participant in, uh, in, uh, in mechanisms like the Indian Ocean, Ocean Rim Association, IORA, in ASEAN, ASEAN-led uh, ASEAN instruments like the East Asia Summit, ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting Plans, ASEAN Regional Forum, uh, as well as BIMSTEC and Mekong Gonga Economic Corridor. India has also been convened the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, IONS, where the navies of the Indian Ocean region participate. Though the Forum for India uh, for India Pacific Islands Corporation, FIPIC, India is uh, stepping into engaging the Pacific Island countries. India's multi-layered engagement with China, as well as strategic partnership with Russia, is the witness to ensuring a stable, open, secure, inclusive, and prosperous Indo-Pacific. In, in, in these view, the Indo-Pacific as a geographic and strategic expanse concerning the 10 ASEAN countries with the two great oceans. Inclusiveness, openness, and ASEAN centrality and unity therefore lie at the heart <coughs> of the notion of Indo-Pacific. I think it is very clearly stated that how India feels about Indo-Pacific. And I think uh, so far as this uh, uh, feeling is concerned, it has been executed in different domains in different way. <clears throat> uh, if we, uh, and, and these are visible in the increasing importance of awareness in maritime doctrine, in creating, uh, increasing, uh, you know, uh, operating, uh, I'm sorry, is it, just, uh, sorry, uh, increasing uh, importance of uh, operational uh, reach of Indian Navy, also increasing uh, importance of strategic uh, coordination and uh, improving interoperability, uh, improving capacity building <coughs> mechanisms, and uh, improving uh, maritime infrastructure. I think uh, these are very, very important domains at this moment for the government of India. But uh, it is also interesting to note or, uh, you know, to realize uh, one uh, difficult, uh, one difficult question so far as India's visualization of Quad is concerned and how India uh, will manage to convince USA to deal with Quad and to deal with Indo-Pacific separately. I think this is the current dilemma that Indian government, it's of course, uh, this uh, perception is uh, totally our own perception. Uh, what we feel as uh, a researcher uh, coming from international relations backdrop that it is very important uh, how India will deal with these issues together 
to uh, emphasize, to put stress on her own uh, perception towards Bay of Bengal as well as towards Indo-Pacific. Because Indo-Pacific is not a kind of standalone construction. Bay of Bengal also is a major pillar of that new construction of Indo-Pacific. So I'll, uh, I'll end here. And uh, uh, I'm very sorry to come up with these sketchy ideas because I didn't get that information, prior information. Otherwise, uh, next time probably, uh, that will be more uh, a formal uh, presentation. Thank you so much. And our connectivity hopefully will uh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, our think tank uh, is, is helping the government of India, especially the eastern side, to look at the economic growth uh, of the eastern, eastern uh, India, especially the big ports. You heard the uh, doctor has mentioned a couple of areas of interest. Um, maybe for us, it's much more of interest is the, the last portion. Um, the word, the term quad was used. The, uh, the, the term Indo-Pacific was used. Okay, uh, and the term doctrine was used. And all this uh, coming from the military world, these are quite interesting to us. Because in the equation, uh, there's a, the equation, when you put all them in one equation, uh, economic, uh, and then you, you put the strategic interest there, uh, there's always this back of my mind as military personnel, what is the bigger picture? What is the end state? Uh, uh, India's interest in strict some like uh, I would like to go back uh, a couple of years back when strict some like was uh, declared a war zone by Lloyds and, and many of the countries in this region, Japan, India, wanted to send their warships into this area and that was the one that drove uh, then the CDF, uh, then the CDF, anyway, um, that was, uh, that's what the, the impetus for the CDF then, uh, Admiral Tan Sri Anwar. Okay, uh, to, to discuss with his counterparts and come up <coughs> with this Lekker Straits Patrol, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia and Singapore initially, then Thailand, uh, so that we wanted to keep to the ASEAN way of doing things, uh, non-alignment, uh, non-interference by outside of the forces, and that's how that thing came about, uh, Lekker Straits Patrol, uh, because that's the intent. Uh, now you see, if you have read, read a bit about this Indo-Pacific and Asia-Pacific, China is not too happy with this change of uh, nomenclature because when you say Asia-Pacific, China was the center. Now when you go to Indo-Pacific, India becomes the interest. So uh, that is another area that we're looking at. And then if you look at the sudden interest of, of Bay of Bengal, you can also to look at China's investment in Myanmar, China's investment in Bangladesh, China's investment in Sri Lanka, foregoing India. So, um, if it is a, a strategist like myself, my question is, why sudden interest in Bay of Bengal? Uh, is it India's way of uh, joining Japan Australia and um, US, but I think Doctor was mentioning it was more of economic interest. So all these ties together. So uh, and one of the thing that they have come down to look at is support Klang, and they actually wanted to go to Tanjung Pelepas to look at how this. And my quick research on converse, convergence and divergence, which I presented uh, there, I found that most of our trade from Port Klang and Tanjung Pelepas goes not to the eastern ports but to uh, on the other side, uh, Mumbai. Uh, reason being, uh, I was quite surprised to hear in uh, the eastern part, they say that it's shallow. But from a naval officer, and I've talked to the submariners who were there, the two retired admirals, uh, the eastern part is much more deeper than the western part. 
because Vysak is where the submarine squadron is and the submarines operate from the eastern part of India. So probably she can get some ideas uh, on that and uh, on, on the strategic part of it. Uh, so these are the questions which was, that ran through my mind when I was going to Kolkata. Uh, is is this anything to do with the Quad? Is this anything to do with this new construct that's coming up, uh, Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific? And you must remember, uh, before Indo, uh, the US PACCOM has now become the Indo PACCOM uh, changed. So as uh, Doctor was mentioning, the US might look at it from different perspective. Uh, India might look at it from a different perspective. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has said something different. Uh, uh, Pr Prime Minister of Japan has said something differently. And now Indonesia actually buys the idea. But Malaysia, as of today, is very silent on this Indo-Pacific. We have not actually said anything about it. Uh, we are just look, uh, we are waiting and seeing and looking at <coughs> it uh, and see what the Foreign Office will talk about it. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to invite you all to ask any questions within that sphere that has been discussed or outside that sphere uh, before you ask the question just introduce yourself and uh, place your questions uh, you can ask one two three but make sure your questions the preamble of the question is short and sharp okay Aini what our chief executive has said earlier um, regarding the Indo-Pacific. But as far as a response from India, because I was going through the ORF report uh, that India government is planning to increase military presence at ANI. And earlier you mentioned about HDR at ANI as well. So I'm just curious, um, what are your thoughts? Um, because as you know, HDR, when we talk about HDR is about civilian-led program. And then when we're talking about Increasing military presence there is like a count. It's sort of like it doesn't jive in together. And um, what are your thoughts on this? Um, where is uh, Indian government planning to go with this, especially in the ANI area? Um, my second question is um, this relate back because you mentioned about going to Myanmar and that was after the HDR. So is there any Rohingya refugee in ANI? Um, and my third question is, you mentioned about decentralization of, of um, HDR and how the local communities are involved in HDR management. Um, could you please uh, elaborate further more on what, kind, what sort of involvement and an example of the activities they are involved in? Thank you. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for raising these uh, interesting questions, uh, specifically in terms of A and I. And I'll, I'll go back to your, uh, you know, interventions. <coughs> uh, well, so far as uh, I'm taking up Rohingya issue, uh, you know, first. Uh, we know that uh, they have been regarded as uh, boat people as well. Uh, but uh, when both of us, we visited uh, Andaman, we didn't get uh, information that uh, the, the presence of information regarding presence of uh, Rohingyas in Andaman Nicobar Islands from uh, the government, uh, you know, officials. So in the government level, we have not, uh, we have not, uh, yet received any information regarding presence of uh, Rohingya refugees or Rohingya stateless people in, uh, in Andaman. And, uh, uh, but, you know, I'm just uh, sharing uh, another uh, perspective into it that uh, what if is also working on uh, public health hazards among the refugee camps of Rohingyas in Bangladesh. This is exclusively for you. And, uh, so far as uh, the local uh, community's involvement in uh, the HADR structure, yes, uh, we uh, talked to the government officials uh, regarding this involvement. They say that the main involvement is 
they have made people aware and for that particular awareness program they have uh, framed small uh, community based network where some of the local people they are being picked up and chosen to give a leadership to uh, uh, you know for the proper uh, function fun uh, to make uh, that uh, uh, that um, groups functional which means in every village uh, they framed a community network and within com this community network they picked up some uh, some uh, some persons specifically for uh, the operability of that particular uh, community based network and in that way uh, the government is getting more and more information easily uh, from the grassroots level which earlier it was a kind of vacuum in that decision making structure so uh, what we have found is interesting in it that uh, in sunday framework we know that uh, united nation is putting stress on uh, this community based network and also how uh, the de decentralization me mechanism can be uh, dealt with and in that case what we uh, we felt after visiting andaman and talk to government officials those who are responsible for hdr they said that this is the uh, very positive uh, story that uh, they are um, actually getting from the grassroots level uh, um, networks and the uh, village networks community uh, networks in recent level which was not there before uh, 2004 so these are uh, this is a kind of re remarkable <coughs> thing and uh, so far as um, you know uh, you have, i think you have raised also the question in regarding to, uh, regarding me yeah military and hdr uh, precisely this is the main concern that we are in a very very uh, you know in kind of dilemma how to deal with that these two uh, you know concerns together uh, we raised this question when we were we were in andaman nicobar islands and probably you know that andaman is the place where tri command is operative where military army and air force we, we uh, met them all together and uh, also if you follow andaman you will see a kind of parallel dilemma all through prevalent was prevalent in indian uh, you know, uh, Indian uh, policy domain, how to deal with Andaman, because these two factors are very important. And how to make a balance in between, you know, <coughs> that's why s uh, since independence, to, to some extent, a kind of conservatism uh, has been all through followed, so far as for policy framework is concerned in India. Uh, there was a battle between conservation and development. And this battle actually vitiated the atmosphere in uh, military uh, uh, you know, area or the military domain as well. Uh, when we raised this issue, the development, then the main concern uh, came up in um, military domain is to what extent? How can you actually open up Andaman Nicobar Island because of its strategic location? But we also know that very recently in Andaman, we have opened one air base. Uh, the name of the uh, Kosha, Kohasa. Yeah, we have to open up uh, INS Kohasa, that air base. Okay, so we are also thinking in a different way how to make a balance between uh, military concerns and the development of Andaman and Nicobar Islands because we know that Andaman it situ is situated very close to the Straits of Malacca where the main uh, trade flow is going on. So uh, all these factors should be kept in mind and this is precisely the question we are dealing with uh, in this uh, project. Thank you for raising this one. Just, just this question about I think so. Another question is, 
In HADR, the biggest issue is, which I have always been I heard, civil military relations. No, oh, yes, yes. Okay, civil yes. military relations, I would like to, coming from a point from a military man, yeah. uh, the issue is always being raised is, should HADR be, be led by a civilian? Yes. All the military. Mm. But at the end of the day, Katrina, mm. when uh, the Katrina happened, uh, it's a civil organization handling it, but when the people got into into dire straits, they question why the police <coughs> force was not used. In Malaysia, the same thing happens. When the floods take over, the first question raised by the public, the rakyat, the citizens, why isn't the military playing a bigger role? Uh, we see that this issue that uh, I need for has always been a challenge. Uh, the military doesn't want to play a role as, as a, a leading role. But the thing is, you must remember, the military mechanism has the capacity and the capability mm. of, of uh, transport, yeah. aircraft, helicopters, mm. boats, and all this stuff. Now, uh, and it needs to be hand in hand. The problem is always raised uh, when we went to Indonesia to during tsunami to provide uh, <coughs> assistance. Our aircraft, our Charlie One One Three Zeros, were actually pelted with stones by the Indonesians. Why bringing aid to them? So sovereignty issues is another yes. problem. Uh, so I don't think so. This 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 issue about civil military, uh, who's who supposed to lead, who's Will be. I think all countries face this. Mm. Um, in the states, it's quite clear that their constitution says the military should not be used within the. But at, when it comes to this kind of disasters, mm. who has the capacity yes. more than the, yes. the other than us? Yes. So Aini's question is quite pertinent. Yes. yes. And even in Malaysia, uh, we always say that we our national security council mm. and Dakma now has to lead, mm. but at certain point times. When it comes to adverse, they become paralyzed. Mm. So the military has to come in. Mm. So in your case, yes. I think it's, it's another big question. Yes. Uh, while in t mm. intensifying the ANI area, uh, there was always this question. Mm. Building up forces in a strategic location mm. there, if it's not narrated well, yes. then it might be it might be taken uh, as a as a uh, Perceived as forces being built up mm. to either deter the Chinese mm. influence mm. in Bay of Bengal. Mm. So that, that has to mm. be really looked at. Yes. How you narrate it. Yes, in, in it, 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 is, it is very important because, Just, I, as I uh, also talked about, different kinds of perceptions. So, different kinds of perception prevalent within your country as well. Agreed. So, you have to narrate your case. But I think it is uh, important in AMI also. Because what we uh, uh, saw in A9 that uh, it's uh, basically under the umbrella uh, framework of tri, uh, you know, or that uh, uh, tri services command. Yeah, we call it joint in our yeah, yes, joint tri, and we call it tri services command, including army, uh, navy, and uh, air force. And when we uh, did research exclusively on HADR. Then we saw that all kind of first responses came from Navy. And there was a kind of uh, good uh, understanding between, uh, between civil authorities and Navy uh, based on that emergency situation. But it is also very important to understand in general the mechanism in, yes. you know, between them. This, this uh, that's why we have a doctrine yes. called civil military relations. <laughs> yes. Okay, anyone yes. else? Any questions? Yeah. Good morning, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, Ratna Karan Sudan from uh, Maidas. My question is with regards to BIMSTEC. Okay, one of the areas of cooperation of BIMSTEC is uh, poetry, poetry elevation. So far, since its, its establishment, nine, uh, 1997. So, what is uh, its achievement so far? Being, I mean, saying that uh, we know that the member states has a different background and so capacity. So, what are the achievements so far? Because in ASEAN, so we have the similar kind of uh, situation. 
so nothing is moving that far, you see. So wh what are the achievements so far in terms of going to I'm so sorry because uh, I... Uh, call the ASEAN Military Ready Group which is now being discussed because the ASEAN military ready group is supposed to be it's now focused on HDR within ASEAN. Okay. So each country will, will actually uh, pass <coughs> an asset or a couple of assets mm. to help in this um, process of that is any country which requires uh, assistance, HDR assistance. Mm -hmm. Now uh BIMSTAC can also look at that. I know your SAC has already yeah. Died of natural yeah. death because yeah. of Pakistan and India's mm. uh, love hate marriage. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, so maybe you can use beam stack yeah. and start looking at having this kind of uh, nexus mm. uh, within mm -hmm. Myanmar. Uh, you have actually two of the ASEAN members with you mm. in beam stack mm. uh, Myanmar and Thailand, Thailand. Mm. and then you have Bangladesh, India, and Sri Lanka. Mm. So, probably you could have in your uh, <laughs> Proposal for HDR, mm -hmm. a, a similar organization which you can learn from Myanmar and Thailand mm -hmm. because they are in the group. This ASEAN military ready group, you could have one mm -hmm. Bay of Bengal military ready group where you can share experiences in HDR and come out with SOP. That we are coming, we actually have an SOP, a, a standard operating procedure. A tabletop is being conducted, I think, a certain level of, so they can discuss. And that become actually that is actually a confidence building measure. Uh, so Andaman can be the center for ANI can be the center for the tabletop. Invite these guys and you know uh, have a tabletop, see how they can assist. So, and in the bigger picture, when there is actually a major crisis, uh, tsunami doesn't only happen in one area; it can happen. So these two ready groups can come together or and in in a bigger, so they can be actually like you know. Uh, uh, the spokes in a in, in, in a wheel, so rather than trying to uh, India trying to join or uh, mm. take interest in Sri Lanka, India. So you have a ready group looking at Bay of Bengal, and you have a ready group looking at ASEAN, yes. and these guys can share. And when it comes to IOPS, which I have attended, uh, they can have these discussions uh, further enhance these discussions. Uh, on, on discussing about how. So that is one way of, mm -hmm. I think, moving from a uh, single approach, unilateral yes. approach, to confidence building measure and, and future trust building measure. But, uh, I'm very happy, and I'm sure uh, my colleague Pratnashi will be also happy to know the same kind of uh, you know perspective. Because in our last publication uh, that I think uh, with my colleague uh, Sholini Bose, uh, we have produced uh, one uh, issue brief on uh, BIMSTEC and HADR. And we intended to uh, develop these kind of perspective, how all the BIMSTEC countries come closer together to frame one kind of platform to deal with HADR, and how this platform can be extended uh, by including all other member states of ASEAN, which means how we can, uh, you know, learn from the, uh, from your best practices cases that uh, you dealt with within ASEAN. Mm. And then we can have a kind of two groups will work together, ASEAN and BIMSTEC. Yes. So we came up with this yeah. idea and I'm so happy to see the same uh, kind you, of perspective you, you can, together. You can. And where also ANI can play important role. I'll, I'll forward it to you, uh, that you should be, or you can uh, visit our website and can do download it also. We yeah. came up with the same vision. I'd just like to know okay. whether uh, in, in your research, have you considered uh, neighboring development programs? For example, uh, within uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand, we have a growth triangle, mm -hmm. Indonesia, Malaysia, mm -hmm. Thailand growth triangle. Uh, whether that has been considered as well. Mm -hmm. and I think <coughs> other development programs we did. Yes, eventually it will come up. In our first phase, we didn't because our, con uh, our concentration was on Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. And so that if you go through our report, you will find that BBIN uh, covered in a large way, which uh, means you know that the 
the sub-regional uh, initiative that uh, came up in recent days is Bangladesh, Bhutan, India and Nepal. Uh, it came up with a motor vehicle agreement, but uh, after you know Bhutan's re uh, rejection, temporary rejection for motor vehicle agreement, then we decided to go ahead with the entire agenda of BBIL. So now, within South Asia, this kind of sub-regionalism uh, has got its momentum. So we looked at the <coughs> kind of issues and the growth, uh, uh, you know, uh, the mechanism and the prospects in terms of BBI in first place. So all these kind of prospects so far as that triangular uh, development is concerned or Mekong, uh, you know, uh, sub-region is concerned, it will come up in our, this report. Definitely, we will uh, take it. Okay. In your report, would you be looking at maritime security issues in yes. Bay Bengal? Yes, yes. yes. And how would you be addressing those issues as, as, uh, as a single country mm -hmm. or are you going to use BIMSTEC to? I think, in fact, also it uh, needs you like expert suggestion as well. That's why we are here. But we are thinking to deal with first individually, then collectively. Because it's multi-layered, you know. Uh, at least within South Asia, it's multi-layered. Within ASEAN, you have one ASEAN way to deal with that issue. So I think uh, being located in India, it will be good to uh, see it first individually, then uh, in a multilateral way or uh, you know, holistic matter. What, what, what is your, do you have any uh, suggestion? Well, we have, because our our neighbors are very close and um, non-traditional threats, transboundary issues, yes. mm. uh, quite rampant. Mm. Um, the other problem with us is, you have been, vis you visited Indonesia, mm. you visited Singapore. Mm. Uh, the problem with this IMB, International Maritime Bureau and RECAP, which is in Singapore, and IMB is in KL. <coughs> uh, they don't differentiate normal uh, criminal activities uh, and piracy. So we, we always have this issue about Straits of Malacca being... Anything that happens in Straits of Malacca, they, they use this terminology called piracy. Mm -hmm. in, law of, uh, in law of the sea, unclaws, mm -hmm. piracy is anything that happens uh, in the high seas. Mm -hmm. That anything that happens within uh, territorial waters is called sea robbery. Mm. So when they start classifying us in these issues, mm. uh, <coughs> I think it's basically because they like to be relevant. Mm. In, okay, in the, in the Bureau. And the other the location of the, the, the incidences, nobody actually looks at it where, where it actually mm. happens, mm. whether it's in the Malaysian side of waters. Or is it the Indonesian side of it? It is very important to yes. uh, you know, analyze. In, in Singapore. Mm. And most of the time it happens in the Indonesian side of the water mm. and the Straits of Singapore. Mm. But when they use categorize it as Straits of Malacca, mm. and the whole world knows Straits of Malacca is only actually <coughs> from, from coming from the Andaman mm. and right straight down to uh, Tanjung Pi area. Mm -hmm. And that's called Singapore Straits. Mm. And this is another issue that uh, I can mm. talk about this because mm. I have been a, a co-chair in the Malaysia Straits Patrol, okay. Sea Patrol. Mm. And always this issue turns up because mm. most of the incidents happen in the, in, in the Indonesian side of the water. Mm. The daytime, they are normal fishermen, uh, traditional fishermen. Mm. By night, they turn into the, the, the high part of it. So there's slow moving vessels or fishing boats which are trawling. They go on board, they take handfuls, they take cash. So these are criminal activities. And how do you negotiate with the Indonesia then? Well, this, this is the thing that we, we have this Malacca Stress Control, so we inform the Indonesians. And uh, again, it's a sensitive issue. Because uh, most of the incidences are uh, done, I mean, uh, culprits are Indonesians. So we have to handle it very diplomatically. Whereas in the Singapore Straits, Merchant vessels, because of the, the narrow and the shallow depth of mm -hmm. Singapore Straits, big vessels have to slow down. Mm -hmm. So when you slow down, the tendency is this traditional fishermen or these uh, uh, people, 
uh, syndicate and all that. They move out from the Indonesian islands, bought, take spare parts, or whatever they can get. Uh, they don't actually hijack a vessel. So that happens in Singapore straight. But when IMB and RECAP report it, it's straight from Malacca. So there, there is a total, you know, uh, normal people it's straight from Malacca. But actually, if you plot it down and you look at it exactly, you will see on our side of the waters, it seldom happens. Maybe in the ports, it might happen. You know, some guys walking up the gangway or climbing up the side. So those are criminal activities. The police handles it. Um, so this is another issue. And the blackest petrol model is good because at least we sit down and discuss about it with <coughs> countries. Uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, and, and Singapore. We discuss about it. We highlight these issues. And sometimes they come to resolutions that we will actually uh, correct how, it. How often do you meet? Every quarter. Every quarter the meeting is done with the joint working groups. And once a year is the JCC, the uh, Joint Chiefs uh, Committee, the Chairman's Committee, which is the highest level. So that model has been used in Sulu uh, where now is Malaysia, Indonesia, and Philippines. So this is a model which if you think it is suitable uh, and if you think there is this transborder issues, uh, people coming up from, as an example, from Bangladesh and you know, or people coming up from Myanmar, uh, you can use either criminals or sea robbers or whatever. So, or Sri Lanka. And you can come up with this. The beauty about this model is we do not uh, incur displeasure by going by actually challenging sovereign, sovereignties or overlapping areas of uh, claims. Mm. So we patrol on our side of the waters, mm. Indonesian patrol on their side, uh, Singaporeans patrol in their waters, and Thai on the northern side. Mm. But when it comes to air patrol, eyes in the sky, they come together in one aircraft and they go around. Mm. So then they have another third group, it's called the intelligence exchange group, where the intelligence guys actually exchange information. So it works. It works. Uh, the Europeans and the Western world have been always trying to harp on issues that this doesn't work. Mm. Uh, no, no, we have our own way. Yeah. That's so the that's the problem. They always question us when we go to seminars. You know, no, no, no. what is the relevance? You know, uh, yeah. sad to say, most academics do that. So to us, it works. Yeah, definitely. Getting four countries to sit down mm. and talk. Mm and living in a sovereignty issues and all other issues, talking about maritime security, it works. Yeah, uh, yeah maybe you get some, some friction here and friction there, but it works. So maybe in Bay of Bengal, you can look at this kind of model. Okay, yes. the model that you don't, you don't actually talk about overlapping claims, you do not talk about sovereignty issues. The difference between the Malacca model and the Sulu Sea model, the Sulu Sea model has one advantage uh, the advantage is Philippines has given uh, go ahead for us to do hot pursuit. I mean, if the, if the crime is occurred in Malaysian waters, mm -hmm. we can go yes. into Singapore and yeah. into me. It's no problem. Here we got to ask for it. In the Singapore, in the Malacca State Patrol, we have to ask for permission. There, our permission is already granted. So, we, we, hot pursuit is not a problem. Uh, because this is, it is with the uh, Kidnap for Ransom Group, uh, Abu Saya and they have declared as terrorists, so it's not an issue. Yet. So we can apply that kind of yes, concept. Yes. Uh, we have three, we, the three concepts of eye in the sky, you know, it works together. And another confidence building measure mm. that we can, we can look at, bringing BIMSTEC into, into the thing. Right. And that also gives uh, confidence in trading. Mm. The set is basically what you want to do is stable seas. That is what you look at. Mm. Uh, this, uh, this is the models that uh, we can share with you. Yes. Thank uh, you so much. The only thing is, must remember, uh, we don't mind receiving uh, whoever our friendly countries are into Malaysia for capacity building mm. and capability building, but not to be involved in uh, patrolling our waters or you know uh, having your assets here physically, having your your we call it um, uh, your, your boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is already a sovereignty issue. Mm -hmm. 
But if you are coming, China comes here, Russia comes here, America comes here for visits, sport visits, and uh, you want to share knowledge, you want to share capacity building, I think it's not an issue. But when we go beyond that, <laughs> taking part, I think that we, that's a no-no in any any country. Uh, that is something that we look at. So anyone else has any questions? Okay. Uh, Chef, I'm Major Mukhish from Infantry uh, Directorate. Um, this question also regarding your thoughts before. Um, Bangladesh is now expanding their Navy um, on this issue so for the security purposes. So is it India also doing the same thing? And number two question is regarding about the who will take charge on the security area of the Bengal uh, when this thing is happen in the future. Basically, saying the Bay of Bengal, uh, if anything happens there, who will be the, the lead? Yeah, that's a that's a very uh, interesting uh, question. Uh, at this moment, I think uh, Bay of Bengal, uh, that official framework, Bimstead, is not in a situation to take care of that uh, you know uh, that urgency. But if we can develop uh, Bay of Bengal, the way you develop, uh, you know, your uh, sub-regional group as well as ASEAN, then probably Bay of Bengal can take care of the situation. But yes, of course, uh, if any situation uh, arises at this moment, uh, of course, all eyes will be on India. Because uh, at this eastern part of uh, uh, Bay of Bengal, which means uh, east coast of India along with Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. Uh, definitely all of them, they uh, try to uh, look at India. But don't forget the increasing importance of China as well. Uh, especially, uh, you have talked about very correctly that India, um, that China's, uh, uh, you know, uh, China's uh, importance in uh, Myanmar, also in, uh, in the development of ports of uh, Sri Lanka. But at the same time, Sri Lanka is also facing a kind of uh, different uh, situation so far as the uh, date uh, problem is concerned, um, you know, being engaged with uh, China in development of ports. So all these, uh, uh, these things are going hand in hand. It doesn't mean that uh, one side of the picture is rosy and uh, the other side of the picture is, uh, there is no picture at all. But of course, these two uh, things are going uh, side by side. Uh, so at this moment, yes, uh, you are right that uh, for Bangladesh, Bangladesh is in a situation where Bangladesh is very, very closely uh, tied with uh, India in every aspect and uh, and uh, almost its existential thing is with India but uh, there is no point of denying that Bangladesh has got a huge uh, run from uh, money from China for its uh, develop infrastructural development. So uh, I think so far as South Asian situation is concerned, this is a reality. So it depends on the state how to negotiate with these two realities, which means the presence of India and presence of China. And uh, it is also true for India that uh, India cannot ignore China. There is no point of ignoring China. So it is be better to understand how to deal with them in, in a cordial way. Uh, it is very, very, very important. So if we can develop uh, BIMSTEC in that way, then probably BIMSTEC can take care of the, all these situations, be it in security, be it in HADR. But uh, since then, definitely the role of India uh, will be very crucial. Yes, I think that um, you know that China, um, the way they expand their, their um, power is by using to fund another country like the Sri Lanka and also the Bangladesh. So might be one day um, that country will follow what that China needs. So that's why that you need to tolerate with China as well. <laughs> okay, you see. It, it, it's, it's, just, it's interesting, gentlemen, uh, ladies. Um, 
you got to understand the history of India, the history of that region. It's, it's slightly different from religion. You must remember, ASEAN is not an economic uh, construct. It initially was based on confrontation, Absolutely. initially, and all that. Absolutely. And that's how ASEAN was formed by, an, by a few countries. Absolutely. So it was actually a... a then ASEAN. Yes. Uh -huh. So it is actually came up from security issues. Mm -hmm. And that's how we came about uh, ASEAN. And then it expanded into yes. the three three communities, you know, security, political yes. security community, yes. the economic and social cultural. So, and, and here uh, we have our own historical baggage and legacy. India, you must remember the partition and yes. all the other stuff. Uh, my question, first question was, India being India should actually be the lead there, just like Indonesia here, who's actually, uh, it, it is leading ASEAN in such because the ASEAN headquarters is in Jakarta. Okay? Uh, when you go to India and do an eight-month course in Cochin, India is a continent within a continent. Absolutely. Okay? The, the languages you speak there is very different. For every four hours, there's a different language. The ORF uh, initiative is very noble. They like to develop the eastern coast. They like to bring trade to the eastern side. But within India, it is, a, it, it is like what Malaysia is, a federal federalism. Yes. The center and the peripherals have different ideas. Mm -hmm. So not only you have to be content with external influence, internally, yes, to get everybody on the same, same ship is a big problem. If they are on the same ship, you've got to get them in the center. Some are on the starboard side, some are on the port side. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, the ship is either listing yes. the port or listing the starboard. Just like in Malaysia. Eh? The central government wants to do the best for the country, except you might have Kedah was a thing or something else, Kelantan was a thing or something else, Rawa was a thing or something else. So they have a challenge. Corridors. Corridors within Malaysia. Just like, just like Mima, I think the, the counterpart here for them is like Mima. <coughs> Mima is trying to to develop the ports, to develop a uh, blue economy, uh, trying to get, uh, you know, um, we have a concept called here, CASBAT, uh, Kesamatan and Pembangunan, which is actually security and development. So when you, and the, and the, the equation is, you have to be secured. When you have security, you have stability. When you have stability, you have prosperity. So that is the concept that we've been using since the uh, emergency days. So we have security there, and then we stabilize it, and we have some some uh, development going on there, some trade, some businesses. When people are content, they will not support the insurgents, then you have prosperity. So that is the concept which we are trying to now develop. Now it's going to go to security and um, development at sea in the Sulu Seas to give people on the eastern coast of Sabah uh, some form of cottage industries so that we can uplift their, their life. So when they become, you know, then they might tend not to support this kidnap for ransom groups, you know, and all those stuff. So it, it's going to take some time. Yeah. And your efforts are very noble. Uh, I know it's going to be challenging. It is. And, and you know, you can do your, all your research. <laughs> But if the politicians are not on board, yes. the political yes. will is not there. Yes. Uh, I'm surprised because I, I was in Kolkata, and um, and usually what I do is I don't ask researchers. And so the driver was driving me to the hotel. I asked him, "How is West Bengal? Uh, no, how is um, uh, Prime Minister Modi? Very good." How is your prime minister, uh, your chief minister, not good? <laughs> so that, that's his perception of a guy, okay, who drives uh, day in day out, uh, and uh, families in, in the village, and he is working in town. So you can see that kind of uh, the dis discontent. That, and I was surprised uh, you, if you if you compare Port Klang and you compare Kolkata, and you'll see the difference mm. between. So I think that they have the strength, 
they have everything there. It's only how the, they're going to put it together. Mm. And how you want to get the big ships there. Mm. Uh, the container ships and all that. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Dredging has become a really, really big problem. Dredging is expensive the, yes. and you cannot be doing it. Yes, yes. Okay, yes, so yes. hopefully you you have you have the thing. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Oh, yes, sir. suddenly the right time. As I used to I'm from the Defense College. I just want to give some views about uh, your approach on, on this uh, so-called maritime connectivity. Um, I think um, we are very well connected. I think with India, uh, every time we sail to the east, uh, to the west, uh, we always uh, visit India. You know, and uh, there is no doubt that uh, you are very well connected to us. But the thing is, as mentioned by uh, uh, Admiral uh, Ganesh, that the consideration of the political will, uh, because I think the security architecture that you have uh, currently or you're going to pursue is on a quad. And that is uh, something that you have to consider because um, that kind of security arrangement would not be to the liking of the ASEAN countries uh, as it could create some security dilemma to, to us and even uh, to our uh, strategic partner, which is China. So these are the, the, the things that you have to, to solve, uh, uh, solve it, uh, internally, domestically. And, and I think everybody knows that uh, I read this India's Maritime Doctrine back in 2004 that uh, India is coming, becoming a rising maritime power. Mm -hmm. uh, and also um, the change of uh, command from Indo, uh, from Pacific Command to Indo Command. And uh, you are having, uh, India Marit Indian Navy is having a, a maritime exercise every year in, in the South China Sea with Vietnam. Mm -hmm. you know, so these are the things that you have to really look into. Mm -hmm. I think if as far as uh, security is concerned, uh, probably uh, it creates some uh, skeptical or perceptions on, on that. But if we go on the economic part of it, maybe we have more connect, uh, mm -hmm. connected. We are more connected uh, than, than before. I remember that last time there was uh, this uh, Bay of Bengal large, mar uh, large marine ecosystem. Uh, which was established uh, uh, as far as uh, it is concerning about the marine resource uh, uh, exploration um, uh, uh, cooperation. You know, this are, probably this is the mechanism that you have to use as a, your as your platform to put forward your uh, so-called maritime connectivity. And uh, I, I I I'm not sure whether it's only maritime connectivity I'm talking about. Uh, maybe you have another connectivity which may be similar arrangement like a BRI. So these are the things that you have to seriously consider when you engaging the ASEAN countries. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 69 bridges sorted out. <laughs> <laughs> probably China will sort it out for them. <laughs> Unless India is willing to invest. Anyone else? Nari? So, Dr. Rukman Arin from Navy Plans. The development of the Kra Cadel they have positive look towards uh, the expansion of significance of the Bay of Bengal. So China is eventually going to mm. pump the money in and it, uh, may make it happen. Is that something that India would like to take uh, an early step towards uh, achieving? It's very, it's very interesting. In, in fact, precisely this question we raised when we were in Thailand. Uh, you know. Uh, India was initially also interested uh, in that uh, Kra Canal opening up proposal. <coughs> but uh, at this moment, I think uh, it's not very, uh, you know, uh, very, uh, yeah, yes, because Thailand is not at all keen. We raised this issue with uh, Thai, um, uh, you know, Navy at the same time in, um, in Ministry of, uh, in his Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, from both the angles, we got information that it's not possible and no, no situation. So from India, now it's not. But there's a different sentiment that they are sending towards China. So yes. uh, I would assume that the relationship between India and Thailand is, is pretty close. So yeah. you're saying that the possibility of uh, of that happening between uh, with, with India's involvement is uh, not existent. Is that, is that what you're saying? Um, I'm, I'm not sure uh, if, if you mean India helping in the building of the Krakenal, then I don't think India yes. is in a position financially or infrastructurally mm. to do to do it at all. But India will be able to help only if 
other parties are also involved and it is one of the parties who is helping in the development of the canal. But as of now, what we learned from our uh, trip to Thailand is that the government is not keen at all. So I am not sure that if the, if the government is not keen at all, then no party How I can think can uh, go yeah, ahead with it. No China cannot, uh, I hope, unilaterally go ahead with the <laughs> Kraken has. China, China, but in, in China, 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 China is very keen because it wants an alternative route to the Straits of Malacca. That is why it wants the Kraken But so that would open up uh, a faster Exactly, yeah. faster and, and China, 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 wider China. China. Mm. Uh, but Can that be a, a added burden on the current existing geopolitical uh, will, issues yeah. that you are facing. So it, isn't it, it something that uh, you would... But at this moment, we don't have any information whether India uh, will join hand with China. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that that is my regarding, regarding that is Canal, but uh, at this, uh, if you ask us uh, regarding India's point of view, India is not uh, in that way interested in developing. In, Actually, there have know, been very few yes. comments regarding yes. that. In, in and Thailand is, is uh, precisely not interested uh, in this, probably because of their domestic. Um, yes. The, the other issue would be mm. to be again mm. dead trap. Yes. <laughs> uh, it will be a dead trap for them if they go into it. Anyway, it's, the Isthmus of Kra is, was hot once, but then mm. it, it's widened down very really much. During the 80s, huh? Yes, 80s. it was quite. Mm. Uh, but I don't think so. It is. It is a feasible at this moment right. of time. Right? In fact, in the our cost, first phase, we. Uh, the cost factors are the reason yeah. why. Uh, <coughs> the other thing is not only the cost, yeah. it is also the ASEAN relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. You, need, you need to look at whatever that happens in ASEAN. The country relationship, Thai perspective yeah. in it. It's I think that's also another reason why it's never happened until now. Uh, so you have a, a very expansionary uh, nation with, with a financial might to do something mm -hmm. like this. And uh, I don't think that too bothered about, about ASEAN relationships uh, and uh, if that actually does materialize uh, it will be a situation but of course I think Thailand yeah, I don't yeah. suppose as of now it has gone to the point where it will be a very tricky situation because China has not really said anything in recent times regarding the Krakenal and given that mm -hmm. Thailand and I suppose other ASEAN countries would also not want it because Thailand is uh, not very keen on it, so I suppose it hasn't gone to that point yet. If it does, then we'll have to just see how it turns out. Anyone has last questions? Okay. Uh, I'm at the Air Office for Defense and Defense Competition. Garrison uh, is the last Sri Lanka. I've got su surprise for all. Not only to Sri Lanka, but also the neighboring country, including India and Bangladesh. Uh, and adding to that, after several days, there are reports that uh, ISIS is threatening to, to, to bring the same thing to Dhaka. So, uh, my question is, uh, what is your view on uh, how we can see this situation and how to, to, to make a thing that to make a very uh, neighboring country clear about this, this uh, threat? It's a very critical, complicated question because I, I, I'm sure I'm not the right person to uh, you know, answer this question. But uh, of course, uh, these kind of issues are uh, major concerns for India too, within India. So uh, India is not very secured from within itself. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll give you an example. Uh, when coming out from Somalia, uh, Jampura, I was the command of, I was the command of Jampura and the queue was in Sahari Jamia. We were on the way out of the Gulf, we stopped over in Mumbai. Uh, and we went to Taj Hotel. Ooh. Two weeks before it was bombed, uh, it was attacked. So, going to the Taj Hotel, uh, you've got to go through metal detectors. They have metal detectors in the front, they got metal detectors at the back. They got uh, seven, eight uh, guys out there. They have dogs. So basically, uh, I think this, this issue about terrorism 
it, uh, like the one that happened Dutch, it's all insiders. So how the weapons got in and all that. Same thing that happened in Sri Lanka. Uh, you know, uh, you're talking about uh, the moving of them to Dhaka and all that. Uh, so far, I've not heard anything on the eastern side. You now have this kind of incidents on the eastern side of. Not really. Not really. Not really. Not really. But you've got to be aware that this, this could be. So, um, this is where, again, uh, whilst promoting these kind of things uh, in the eastern, developing the eastern side, you should also remember that this kind of movement of people, yes, 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 especially yes. The, the western side, how they came in was if you go, if, if you guys are in the Navy and at night you are outside Mumbai, the, east, the western Navy, it is just like, it's like a Christmas tree. Uh, you'll find all lights, the fishing boats is all over the place. And navigating it is a nightmare. And just imagine, you have to just be one of the fishing boats. Okay, and you can just bring in how many, uh, you know, terrorists and all that. Yeah, that's how, that's how it happened. So India is trying to address that issue by having uh, vessel tracking uh, systems. But you know, they are only poor, how many boats that you can afford mm. to buy those things. So, that is, India's maritime border uh, is so porous like Malaysia. Mm. Mm. Uh, they can't park uh, a vessel every one mile. Mm. Uh, so that is the issue. And like in, in Sri Lanka, what happened, if you do your homework well, I think it's all homegrown. Mm. Mm. It's all homegrown. With social media, uh, that connectivity mm. with Social media is another absolutely, thing, absolutely. Uh, and quite surprising. If you read the papers, they knew about the attack, and that no action was taken. Correct. Mm. So in our country, uh, they are they, our special branch have been doing very well, mm. and they've they've been able to curtail these issues. But it depends on the capacity of each country yes. to raise this issue. Yes. My last question, mm. the closing question, mm. would be. How effective would you think your study would be in, in pushing this agenda of developing the Eastern Seaboard? Well, um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm probably sure that the professor will uh, agree with me that we have fantastic uh, response so far as our first report is concerned, where we promoted uh, how uh, you know maritime connectivity and precisely uh, coastal shipping connectivity can enhance bilateral relationship between India and Bangladesh. And uh, after doing our research and uh, came up with a series of proposals, we saw that uh, both the governments, they officially declared that uh, agreement, you know, and paper. And uh, a kind of, uh, I, I talked about this designated uh, commodity trade through waterways. It came up very recently. So which means I'm not going to tell that this is precisely because of our study, but definitely our study because it depends on and based on extensive field visits, talking to local people, traders, officials, experts like you. So we are gathering different perceptions, which didn't in that way in public domain uh, shared with uh, the government officials. So in that way, we are hopeful that before our publication, we will uh, be going to share our findings with you all, whom we are meeting in different concerned countries, <coughs> to know whether we are placing our proposal in order. If you think we can add anything into it, you can suggest. We will take it uh, you know, uh, into account. Then probably we will place our uh, proposals in the report, and that will be submitted after publication to Ministry of External Affairs, Home Affairs, Ministry of uh, okay. Shipping, okay. along with uh, you, who will help us to uh, submit it to your concerned organizations. Okay. So you are addressing it internally as well as and externally? Yes. And of course, we got a very good reply from Nepal and Bhutan. Okay. In fact, our, our report has been cited repeatedly 
in Nepal. Inland for inland waterways. For inland waterways. Okay. Because where we uh, suggested that if that designated route between India and Bangladesh can be stretched uh, to Nepal by including two uh, important rivers that is flowing, again, uh, cross-country rivers flowing in Nepal, uh, if we can include these two rivers uh, in, the, in that uh, protocol route, then it will help Nepal. So your debt is the first part, commerce and logistics, isn't it? Yes. How about HDR? Yes, That's HDR is in the second part. So in the second part? Yes. yes. And the third yes. part is the strategic. Your, but your, your report is going to be all-encompassing or it's going to be a separate report? No, no, no. It's all-encompassing one report which has these three separate parts. So you have actually not got anything onto the higher authorities on HADR? Yes. And because we are we are separately also working on HADR. Okay. Yes. And that is going to be but That will, I think you will be yes. happy to... Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes. I'll be in touch. Yeah. And I'll have some uh, questions also for you if you can help me. So we can sit together for a while. Uh, okay, so, we, after this we can. Uh, these are the okay, reasons. good. Uh, we are helpful. Uh, we are hopeful that something concrete will be done, at least so far as the perceptions are concerned. Right. Because it is always important to know each other first. Okay. Then we can cooperate with each other. Okay. Without knowing each other, cooperation will not sustain. True. <laughs> You don't fall in love without knowing each other, correct? <laughs> Average marriages don't work any day. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, can we give a round of applause? To, uh,